Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn. And in today's solo show, I'm talking about scuba diving and the wonder of travelling beneath the waves. So travel is all about curiosity and the desire to discover new places and experience the extraordinary. It is often about pushing boundaries, extending our comfort zone to the point of challenge and beyond in the hope of discovering something new about ourselves and the world. In this episode, I'll talk about why I learned to scuba dive in the first place, some of my memories of wonder and discovery, the camaraderie shared experience and the common language of scuba diving, the edge of danger and how one time I almost didn't come back up, and mindfulness and living in the moment. So even if you're not a scuba diver yourself, I hope you find it interesting. Why I learned to scuba dive. I love the ocean and I love being near the water. And we didn't live by the sea growing up, but I did learn to swim young and even enjoyed competing at my school. I actually remember doing those races. And then one day puberty hit. (laughs) Well, probably not one day, but you know what that uh, what happens then. And my body changed, my confidence dissipated, and I started wearing thick glasses for short sightedness. Like puberty really was quite hellish. (laughs) But from then on, because I could no longer see properly, but also Um, you know, and I was wearing glasses and and with my body changing, I avoided swimming. I I suddenly became not so good at swimming. I was not very streamlined anymore. And since I was always a quiet, bookish child anyway, I preferred to read or study rather than do sport. So uh, I didn't do much swimming. Uh, But I still love the ocean. And in my late teens, so a few years later then, I did a sailing course. I I wanted to do more in the ocean. I also did kayaking, things like that. But sailing particularly, I wanted to do. My dad had done sailing and I just loved the idea. And But because I still wore glasses, I wore my glasses strapped to my head. If you are someone who does water sports with glasses, you get these um, this sort of strap and it holds your glasses onto your head. But of course, it doesn't stop the sea spray, the salt spray. It really is not very practical and uh, not very sexy either, to be honest, when you're, I think I was, what was I, 17 at the time, when you kind of want to be attractive. <laughs> um, so, and also what made matters worse, the weekend we were down uh, doing this, I took my glasses off to clean the salt off. I must have put them down and one of the boys sat on my glasses and broke the arms. And mortifyingly, I actually had to take them up with plasters. That was the only thing available. And I still remember the shame of wearing glasses um, taped up with plasters. It really is one of those uh, sort of physical moments of visceral shame that I remember, uh, which is kind of crazy, but it did lead to me getting contact lenses aged 19, which I have worn ever since. So pretty much I've worn contact lenses for what, 23, 24 years now. And, uh, but getting contact lenses rekindled my determination to get back into the water. Definitely are amazing. I love contact lenses. So that, that was you know, so I wanted to explain the background to some of my feelings around water, because so often what happens in our lives is related to these childhood memories. Anyway, fast forward to the year 2000, which I've talked about. I was 25, working in London, burned out by my workload, as I talked about in episode three, why I travel. And I relaxed by drinking. You know, in London, you're not, uh, I mean, I went to the gym, but I didn't do physical activities for fun. You know, I didn't do any of that. So when I left my job, 
I wanted to do something completely different. I wanted to experience the world in a new way. And I wanted to change my life and do something I'd never done before. And I also wanted a physical challenge because everything I had been doing um, for fun was really around drinking and, uh, you know, hanging out with friends and stuff. So I wanted to do something that would keep me away from that. And so I flew to Perth in Western Australia in May 2000 and booked a paddy open water course. Now, of course, you can <laughs> you can learn to dive closer to home. <laughs> And in fact, hilariously, uh, um, there's a dive place quite near where I live now. I mean, you can, and we, we don't even have sea. We have, it's on the canal, which is odd, uh, but you can learn to dive anywhere. Um, but anywhere, there's a dive school, obviously. Uh, but I was going down under for a year out. And of course, I'll do an Australia episode at some point. But learning to dive was how I intended to start living in a different way. It represented a kind of a shift back to the things I used to enjoy. I feel like so often we lose the things we're interested in as we go get older. If you think back to, well, what did I really, what do I really love doing? Like, what is fun for me? And I definitely lost an idea of fun and the ocean and the sea and doing water sports was something I really wanted to do again. So the night before the course, I went to the markets in Fremantle. So Fremantle is near the, the is on the coast near Perth, and I listened to a band playing Bob Dylan and Cat Stevens covers. And I did have a VB beer, a Victoria bitter beer. If you've been in Australia, you'll know VB. And I got a henna tattoo, and I have a picture of it. It's, it wasn't very good, but uh, the next day I knew it would wash away. But I wanted to have something that marked the first step in a new me. I wanted to mark my skin, but I wasn't about to get a real tattoo. <laughs> I'm Gen X and tattoos for us are not like millennials. They still, you know, were relatively frowned upon back then. Um, not to mention a stupid idea before going scuba diving. You can't get a tattoo and then go scuba diving. <laughs> but anyway, I I did that. And then the first morning we I arrived at the dive centre and, uh, you know, they tell you a few safety stuff, but they get you in the pool pretty quickly um, because, I mean, and also we put on our wetsuits put on the gear that introduced you to that but then they get you in the pool because I think they want to weed out those people who are going to freak out but also some people do have ear issues and can't equalize even a meter or so um, under the water so a couple of people dropped out that first day and it was you know I'm I am a competitive person but obviously diving is something you do on not on your own but you experience it yourself. Um, it's not a team sport as such, even though there is, uh, you know, there are people with you. Uh, so it was kind of strange. You know, we all started that morning and by the end of the day, some people had already left, <laughs> a bit like the Hunger Games. <laughs> um, so I was, I do remember being scared, um, but determined to make it through. So I could equalise fine, but my heart was pounding a lot. I get headaches um, quite quite easily and I got a headache really fast that day and it was cold in the pool I mean we had three mil wetsuits so reasonably big wetsuits full body wetsuits um also you wear we didn't wear them in the pool but you can wear hoods and other layers because down south in western Australia it's not that warm and especially not that warm in the ocean especially in May which is autumn in the southern hemisphere so you know often people assume Australia is all beaches and sun but Perth has a temperate climate um which is also probably why there are so many Brits there <laughs> but um um, back in the pool. And I remember also how constricting that wetsuit felt on my body. So I'd worn wetsuits before, um, but the you wear the wetsuit, you have the BCD over your chest and it, you can feel the constriction on your body. Now, if you're not used to wearing one, or if you learn to dive in tropical waters, you won't need to wear the big wetsuit. You can wear a shorty or a stinger suit. Um, but actually, over time, I have appreciated learning in those conditions because if you learn in bigger gear, when you go places where you don't have to wear so much, it becomes um, easy peasy. So diving in the tropics, easy peasy. <laughs> but I remember being super aware of every breath. So breathing is critical. <laughs> you, re I mean, when we're above water, breathing seems, and we don't have any breathing difficulties it's very easy to take your breathing for granted but when you're scuba diving 
you are super aware of every breath when you begin and you're trying to regulate it. You can't stop breathing. You, you mustn't hold your breath. You keep it long and slow and regular. But also as your chest rises and falls, it affects your buoyancy. So as you breathe in, your lungs expand, you have more air, you rise in the water column. And if you breathe out, your lungs shrink down, you sink in the water column. So with your breathing, you're trying to be careful with your air, you're trying to breathe properly, but also your buoyancy is all over the place. So when you learn to dive, you're struggling with so much, um, the different gear, your breathing, where you are in the water, where your buddy is following the guide. If you're out in the open water, it's, it's kind of sensory overload. It's pretty intense. <laughs> so after a few sessions in the pool, we went into the ocean, first offshore at Fremantle and then out to Rottnest Island. So the visibility was terrible um, and most of the group were fighting buoyancy. I no doubt was as well, um, adding and dumping air. So your, your BCD, your buoyancy control device, you're kind of putting a few bits of air in because you're bumping along the bottom and then you realise you're heading for the surface and you have to dump some air. And of course, you don't know what you're doing. So it's just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but the, there wasn't much to see. I mean, they don't take newbies to exciting places because they don't want you destroying everything because you're bumping along the bottom. Um, and they don't want it to be too deep, obviously. There were a few fish eating from some rocks and the sounds of cracking and popping and the swoosh of the waves. And it's definitely not silent underwater. I think sometimes the nature films make it sort of seem like, well, if you're using a rebreather, it can be silent, but most scuba obviously has bubbles. So you're, you're breathing, you can hear your breathing, you can hear your bubbles, you can hear the noise of, of things in the ocean. And uh, yeah, so I remember that first dive mainly because I was just didn't want to surface. You're trying to keep yourself down. Um, so we had to do some technical skills as part of the open water And it's not like being in the pool. You actually have to do it out in um, open water. That's why they call it (laughs) your paddy open water. But um, I remember that there was some slight surge, which is the movement back and forward. So if you think about moving back and forwards, um, that's a sort of slight surge. Now, again, coming back to my eyesight, and it's amazing how big a deal this was for me. So I was petrified about taking my mask off. So this is something you have to do. You have to take your mask off, then you have to put it back on, you have to clear it and then make that okay sign. And because of my contact lenses, which I was wearing under a normal mask, I couldn't open my eyes underwater. And I was also petrified about um, losing them. So if you wear contact lenses, you'll know that the worst thing is kind of getting splashed because it dis- dis- dislodges the lens. And I was worried that I would clear my mask and open my eyes only to find my lenses had washed out and I wouldn't be able to see. And it's kind of crazy. So here's a little tip, people. <laughs> if you want to ski or dive and you wear glasses, you can get a mask with prescription prescription lenses. So I would definitely recommend that. And I got one um, later on, but I didn't know that at the time. So the fear of taking my mask off was a huge hurdle for me to overcome. And uh, I never I never really got over that fear. I mean, I, I, I still, I don't think anyone likes taking their mask off, but you need to do it for safety reasons, just in case you, you lose it underwater. Um, So anyway, if it sounds intense, it really was. Um, But the whole point of, and the point of this podcast as well, is the acknowledgement that travelling is about immersing yourself in a different environment, experiencing new things. And scuba diving is a perfect example of that. So Perth, Australia, where I was, might have been the opposite side of the world to London. But to be fair, the culture is not that different. It's pretty similar in Perth than it is in London. So, you know, it's a city, it's a Western city, it speaks English, the food's pretty similar, um, lots of British people. (laughs) So going underwater was the travel experience in those few weeks, not being in a different city on the other side of the world. So after open water and happily I passed, uh, we, um, well, I, I was on my own. I was traveling alone, um, that year. I went north to Exmouth. And if you look at a map of Australia, um, Exmouth is quite a long way. <laughs> so I got one of those really long bus, bus journeys. It's a bit like America, I guess. Um, you know, you, you things are a lot further apart. So I did my first dives after open water on Ningaloo Reef and I, 
now realise, I mean, I realised pretty soon after how special it was to do that. Um, Ningali Reef is incredible. It's, I think it's the only Western fringing reef in the world um, on a Western coast. Uh, most of them are on Eastern coasts, like the Great Barrier Reef is on the east side of Australia. Ningaloo is on the west. Um, and you can snorkel from the shore to it, um, which means there's a lot of uh, life on the reef. So I snorkeled with whale sharks in my first few days and I was digging out photos for this. And you can look at the photos on, um, on the blog post. Uh, but the photos I have, and of course, back then it was those throwaway cameras. So this is the year 2000, uh, throwaway underwater camera. So you get 12 pictures or something, and then you just have to see what they come out like. But I got three quite decent pictures of, of whale sharks, which are these, um, huge sharks. They don't, they're not dangerous to humans. They travel with their mouths open and they just travel huge distances, kind of filter feeding. Um, but it was it was amazing being um, snorkeling. I didn't scuba dive with them. I snorkeled with them. You have to kind of jump in and out the water because they move quite fast and you have to get on a boat and be taken on to the next um, site. So yeah, I did that dive. I also did Navy Pier, which is one of the top 10 dive sites in Australia. <laughs> Again, super lucky to do that so soon after open water. But pier dives are fantastic. Um, you know, I think, again, the romance of scuba diving is sort of pristine coral reefs. But uh, I've dived a lot of piers now and they are teeming with life because often, of course, fishermen are throwing back dead stuff, which brings in a lot of life. So uh, under Navy Pier, lots of nudibranchs and sponges and coral life and schools of snapper and wrasse fish and wobbegong sharks, which look like these shaggy carpets and stingrays. I remember a huge stingray Um also a massive Queensland groper, which are these big bulbous fish. Um, you know, they're not threatening, but they're really big. <laughs> there was a turtle and also a Spanish dancer, which was a beautiful red and white nudibranch, like a flamenco dancer in in the water kind of going past. Um, so diving really is a different world. So often when we travel, there's a sense of culture shock, the language being different, unusual food, different ways of behaving and social rules. Now, when you scuba dive, you can't speak. So you use sign language. You have to follow the rules. You see things from a different angle. You even breathe in a different way. So when you sink beneath the surface, you are truly traveling. You're truly in another world. And although open water was hard, after Ningaloo, I was hooked. wonder and discovery. So once you know how to dive, the physical aspect becomes more natural and easier with more bottom time, as they call it. So I think probably about 20 dives. By the time you've done about 20, you kind of know what you're doing. You're more confident with your gear. Um, I'd say 20 dives in a similar environment, at least. Um, the excitement about diving becomes from seeing new things and different sights and sea creatures and trying new skills. So um, I carried on around Australia and I did my underwater uh, photography uh, on the barrier reef and also my underwater navigator I did um, I think it was underwater naturalist actually on the barrier reef but you know there's lots of different it's a bit like um, being in the girl guides or the scouts or something you can get these different badges that sort of so you do specific dives um, to to take you into different experience you can also do things like rescue diver um, and I went as far as paddy dive master which is a more of a professional qualification where you you can actually work in the industry. Uh, so I did I did a lot of diving. Um, and the truth is that over time, you might do hundreds of dives if you're into it as, uh, as a recreational sport. Um, many of those dives will be unremarkable and unmemorable. <laughs> and it's so, it's so, so I've done, I did, I did uh, nearly 200 dives. Um, and the memories that I have definitely are definitely not of nearly 200 dives but you continue diving because of those peak moments where you see something you haven't seen before or you learn something new or you discover things you didn't even know existed and those moments are truly magical so um this i don't know if this was just because i hadn't seen one yet but i went to perth aquarium before that 
first diving course, looking into, you know, trying to sort of look at the wildlife I might see underwater. And I was gazing into this one tank and I was like, what? what is in here? And then suddenly it sort of came into focus. So a weedy sea dragon, which is crossed between a seahorse and a piece of weed. And again, I've put a picture on the show notes for this. And it's super crazy looking creature. And I did not even know weedy sea dragons existed. Maybe I have just introduced you to weedy sea dragons. And I decided I really wanted to see one in the wild. And it took a couple of years, but um, I did eventually dive at Flinders Pier, another pier dive on the Mornington Peninsula in Melbourne and I saw weedies in the wild and it was really magical. Um, I, like I said, the wonder of realising that this creature, you didn't even know it existed and then you're there with it in the wild. They're only really tiny, but really very, very cool. Uh, Another occasion of this sort of discovery, I was at the Poor Knights Islands in New Zealand where I did a lot of diving and I was doing a safety stop on the top of a pinnacle at five metres, looking around, rooting around in the in the weed and the coral, looking for stuff and saw this crazy looking creature. It was a huge yellow sea slug. Now, if you're not a diver, sea slugs might not sound that exciting, but that's why we say nudibranchs, <laughs> which are these tiny, colourful sea slugs. And they're, they're often what you're looking for. They're, they're beautiful, different colours, and there's lots of different um, kinds. But this this was much, much bigger. And I was super excited. I thought I had discovered some new uh, mutated version of nudibranch because it was big. Um, and on surfacing, I told the dive master about it and he told me it was a sea hare, which again, I'd never heard of. It was not new. It was just new to me. And that is the cool thing about diving, this thrill of possible discovery on every dive. And also how cool it is. That I'm still excited all these years later about finding this. And I remember it so distinctly distinctly um, because of discovery, this thrill of discovery. So this is why I think um, many people think that scuba diving is about the big stuff, about shark diving or seeing big things. But actually, I think most divers, certainly me and anyone who dives in low visibility, (laughs) uh, you know, if you dive slowly and focus on tiny worlds, on the wall life, um, you know, going close to walls and close to coral and close to things. You have to be good at your buoyancy <laughs> to do this. But to me, that's what I remember most is is gazing at, um, you know, patches of wall and finding just cool little worlds in very small spaces. Uh, for example, I love the Christmas tree worms on coral reefs. They they come out of the the coral and they look like a Christmas tree. I've put a picture again on the show notes. Um, they're like little bottle brushes. Um, in the shape of a Christmas tree that pull away. If you put your finger near them, they'll like pull away. So they're alive, but they're just really, really cool. And you can spend hours diving and a lot of money diving, looking for big stuff like sharks or manta rays or whatever. And you may never see one. I mean, you could just look out, stare into the blue in midwater and never see anything. (laughs) Um, So for example, I spent a whole week diving in Tonga in the South Pacific during whale season. And um, the attraction was apparently that at some point, we might see whales underwater and it'd be really cool but we and it was it was a wonderful week had a great time and the sounds of whale song the whole time were around us underwater but we never saw one you kind of always approached a pinnacle expecting to sort of see a whale behind it and that just it wasn't there but you can you can gaze at wall life and discover these new universes that you you didn't know were there so another encounter i remember distinctly and uh this one I don't know, made a huge impact on me. I was diving near a place called Jan's Tunnel at the Poor Nights in New Zealand. I turned away from the wall and there was a huge octopus just a metre or so away hanging in the water on its way somewhere because it was sort of in mid-water. You normally, I'd seen a lot of octopus, um, octopi in the, you know, on the on the ground, in things, covered in weed, covered in shells, doing their octopus thing. But I'd never seen an octopus in mid water and it 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 was so long i i think it must have been 5 foot long it felt like it was almost as big as me i'm 5 foot 6 um from the end of its tentacles to its massive head now of course <laughs> with a mask things are sort of slightly magnified so it might not have been that big and my memory might be wrong but there was an octopus there and it stopped and it looked at me and i felt this strange connection to an incredible intelligence it really was uh, a moment. 
And I wrote about that encounter in my crime thrillers, Desecration, and also in Deviance. In Deviance, I actually give a version of that memory to a character. And um, this character, O, has a full body octopus tattoo. And uh, she performs at fetish clubs like the Torture Garden in London, which is, uh, yeah, fetish sex club, uh, which I have not been to, I must add. But if you have a full body octopus tattoo, then you might as well show it off. But I, the reason she got that is because of the experience I had, this sort of memory. And I have not got that tattoo, as I've mentioned, And I, but I won't eat octopus. And I sometimes wear an octopus bracelet. And again, I've put a picture on, on the show notes um, to remind myself of that, of that day, this uh, encounter. And prob- it's probably why I'm interested in love craft and Cthulhu and that kind of mythos of tentacled creatures. Uh, fascinating stuff. So talking of books, I do often give my diving memories to my characters. Um, Morgan Sierra in Stone of Fire talks about seeing God in nature rather than man-made places. And that memory comes from, again, another one of my dives. So I was diving off the coast. So we went in from the beach um, at Moraki Boulders in the South Island of New Zealand. So these are these big boulders on the beach, but we were diving in the sea nearby. And it was super cold. It was very cold down there. Um, And we were diving in kelp forest which meant that even though my buddy was close by, we couldn't really see each other. It felt very uh, a singular dive. It was dark down in the kelp. And the dive was more about sort of rooting around, looking for octopus and tiny creatures. Uh, so the dive itself was not that memorable. But on the way up at the safety stop at five metres, so you're, you stop and um, decompress a little, I, I turned on my back and looked up through the kelp. And... The sun broke through at that moment and shone down through the water and it was like being in a cathedral with these green fronds arching up over my head and I felt like I was in a cathedral, like I was seeing God in that space and if you've been to the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, it had that sense of majesty and the Sagrada Familia, uh, Gaudi built it, envisioned it with this natural element um, inspired by nature. And as my bubbles rose up towards the sun, I fixed that moment in my mind. And I still, uh, you know, I, I still remember it so vividly. The view of that lying on my back, looking up to the sun through the, the green and just experiencing those few minutes of peace and natural beauty and, and wonder and awe. The word awe, I think, is very much appropriate in a natural environment. So, yeah, after nearly 200 dives, those are some of the moments of wonder and discovery that still stand out for me. Camaraderie, shared experience and a common language. So like many sports and hobbies, scuba diving has a certain camaraderie and common language that marks out those who practice it. So when you get on a boat um, or you go to a dive site, divers will often assess each other by questions about sites and experience and places you've been. And even your gear is going to mark you out as a newbie or someone who knows what they're doing. For example, certain uh, dive computers, um, you know, whether you've got your own wetsuit, whether you're hiring gear, uh, you know, you, you'll be assessed pretty quickly and you, you get the language um, over time. And also the discussion on the dive boat will be about the dive site, the viz, the visibility, the conditions. Uh, one, when, you, when you're before the dive, you'll be talking about what you might see, you know, getting your briefing. Your, and then when you come up, there's the excitement of talking about what you saw, because of course you can't speak underwater. You can like point at things, uh, but you can't speak. So um, the buddy system means you you look after each other when you're underwater. So you're buddied up with someone. Even if you go scuba diving on your own on a dive trip, you will be buddied up with someone, even if it's the instructor or something. So uh, that's part of a a safety um, mechanism, I guess, making sure everyone's okay. There's the ritual of checking your gear, you know, checking your air, checking your uh, regulator, checking each other's gear, uh, checking the agreed sign language that you use to communicate. So all these different things uh, sort of helping each other get ready. 
And of course, everyone knows each other quite well after a day out on the boat because you're getting wet, you're getting semi-naked. <laughs> Some people might be sick. There's a lot of bodily functions happening around the boat.、Um, and as I mentioned, you know, towards the beginning, I、uh, after initially struggling with my body image, I found scuba diving liberating. So I'm not, you know, I'm not Instagram modelly.、Um, I, you know, I'm. I'm <laughs> Let's just say I'm a normal woman, <laughs> but you know, with curves and everything. And I really struggled initially with sort of wearing the wetsuits、um, and and everything. There really is no way to be sexy in a three millimeter wetsuit, salty hair. I mean, seriously, when you pull off your mask, your hair is just a mess and it's tangly, and and you you don't wear makeup and you have marks around your face from your mask if it's on tight, like mine always is, because I didn't want it to come off.、Um, or maybe there's been some. Projectile vomiting off the side of the boat, and、um, you know people get seasick. So, what's wonderful? I just love the fact that on dive boats, bodies are bodies. Everyone has a body, and there are different levels of ability, mobility, and you can dive whatever. You know, if you're a bit bigger, you put on some more weight. <laughs> I mean, you you can get down there, and I just I loved the acceptance that I found within that community. There's also no drinking on the boat and no drinking before diving, so there's no altered perception of attractiveness. There's no,、uh, it's just such a different environment to in my. You know, we're talking about me being in my mid twenties. You know, at a time when a lot of Your self image is about what you look at.、Um, so interestingly, I didn't wear makeup for most of the years when I scuba dived, and I didn't wear makeup probably until I well, actually, I bought my first makeup、um, after for my second wedding in two thousand and eight. So I was the what thirty three by the time I started wearing makeup. It was also around the time I started getting involved with. Professional speaking, and a lot of the women in particular, and also videos on YouTube, and、um, I realised that、uh, I probably needed to wear makeup、uh, to kind of fit in. So, in a really interesting time, I think. But after the corporate world of suits and conversations that revolved around business projects and all that type of stuff, it was so good to be immersed in a culture of nature lovers and those who valued experience over things, and rarely talked about work.、Um, of course, there's a lot of hooking up on dive boats. I'm not denying that. <laughs> But、uh, in fact, my first husband was.、Uh, A scuba diver and a boat skipper, and I met him on a dive boat.、Uh, but、um, yeah, it just—I just felt a lot more confident、uh, in that time. An edge of danger. So modern scuba diving is. Or can be really safe, especially if you go with a qualified school with good instructors and well-maintained equipment. If you have those things, you're going to be fine. And、um, you know, the, with instructors who know the environment, who know the、um, the. The water,、uh, who know the if you're going out into the sea, who know the tides, that kind of thing. So you plan your dive, you dive your plan, you dive within your limits, you listen to the dive briefing, you look after your buddy, you go with an instructor if you want to. There's no shame in saying, look, I'd rather go with an instructor today. I don't want to go off、um, with a buddy.、Um, you know, there's lots of things you can do to make diving super safe, and if you follow the rules, you'll be fine. And it's very、uh, fun. It really is fun. But of course. Part of the attraction with many things is the edge of danger, and let's face it: you're underwater, breathing from a finite tank of air.、Um, if you're diving in an overhead environment, a wreck or a cave, there's the potential to get trapped. You can lose visibility. You can lose your buddy. Plus, you're scuba diving in nature.、Uh, As Tennyson wrote, "Red in tooth and claw." There's a lot of violence in the ocean, not usually directed at you, but happening around you, and you're choosing to go into that. For example, I was on a shark dive in Fiji,、um, and you know, sharks sort of. And they, I mean, I probably shouldn't have been on that dive. They were feeding sharks, which are not meant to do, but、uh, they were kind of ripping these. I remember these sharks ripping this stuff apart, and sort of hanging in the water, going, "Aha!、Uh-huh, I don't really want to be in a pack of sharks ripping things apart." <laughs> but it's、uh, 
It's interesting. I mean, weather is often the biggest danger and the thing that makes it the least fun. Uh, although sometimes the storm can be raging outside and underwater can be the best place to be. So you also realise the fragility of the human body when you dive. So I remember one dive at White Island in New Zealand, which is a volcanic island with incredible reefs and biodiversity because of the warm vents uh, coming up um, from the volcano. Basically, it's still an active volcano, White Island. Um, so the day we went out, it was wild, um, really big surge and the boat was rolling and I was super sick. And uh, But once I got in, I did experience some vertigo in midwater, which is not fun. But 10 metres down, everything subsided and I was fine. And the dive was memorable for the contrast of how lovely it was to be underwater and how awful it was to be uh, up on the boat. Um so the other things, I, I guess, you know, I've done a few shark dives, as I said, in Fiji and around Australia and also night dives with sharks on the barrier reef. Um, but to be honest, I was I haven't I don't recall being scared by sharks, um, but I was scared by a pack of giant barracuda on a night dive on the barrier reef. And I wrote about that memory in The Dark Queen, uh, which is about an underwater archaeologist diving on the buried city of Thonis Heraklion in the um, it, north, north of Egypt. And uh, I actually narrate that audiobook. So if you fancy listening to that, check out The Dark Queen, uh, also available to read. Uh, so yeah, the Bar- the barracuda, I mean, they're f- in when you're night diving, you just have your torch light. So you have a thinner beam and it's black around you. And yeah, I just remember this. They're huge barracuda with these big teeth and silver scales sort of circling above me as I knelt on the on the ground on on the bottom. And uh yeah, that that was probably my scariest night dive encounter. The other thing that uh, can be slightly scary is wreck diving. So they can be absolutely fantastic. I've done quite a few wreck dives. If you plan them well and go with an experienced guide, they're really good. And I do have an obsession, you might have noticed by now, or you will over time on this show, um, with Memento Mori, which is remember that you will die. I think this is an important thing to remember because life is short and we need to make the most of it. But wrecks are evidence of the end of things and also how life continues after we're gone. Wrecks are death and resurrection in one dive. So, for example, in the Bay of Islands, New Zealand, um, I've dived on the Rainbow Warrior. So it was a Greenpeace ship blown up by the French in 1985. Um, The hulk of the ship is starting to collapse now, so you can't go too far inside or perhaps even now not inside inside at all, although I went inside years ago now, Um, but it's a reef. So the hull is covered with rainbow anemone and fish darting in and out of the portholes and huge crayfish making nests in the crevices. It's just, it's a reef. It's still the shape of a ship, but it's a reef and just a beautiful dive. Um, I've done other wrecks, uh, including the Waikato out of Tutukaka, which is uh, in New Zealand again, uh, which is quite big and was sunk deliberately to form an artificial reef. So with wreck dives, the water will surge through the openings. So if you're inside, and it, so it can go quite fast. And if you're inside, the best thing to do is wrap your arms around yourself. So like you're giving yourself a hug and so so you don't hit anything with your hands or get tangled or trapped or anything. And then you have to relax and go with the surge. And at the beginning, I tried to fight it. And if you fight it, you're going to panic. And so you have to kind of just relax and let go. When it pulls you back, you don't try and go forward. You just have to let it drag you back. And then when the surge moves in the direction you want to go, you kick with it and you accelerate forwards. It's actually super fun. <laughs> once you understand how it works. But I do remember trying to fight the surge within a wreck. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I just had this moment of panic, but then I had to let it go and realised the water would always be more powerful than me. And once I relaxed, the wreck was a whole different experience. Similarly with travel, Often you can't control everything. And sometimes the best thing to do is relax and go with the flow and, you know, go with the surge. You can't fight it. The other thing in terms of the edge of fear, I guess, is in recreational diving, you should never dive without a buddy. Uh, But of course, experienced divers do and enjoy the solitude. And I'd been out on the boats a lot one summer with um, my uh, 
uh, boyfriend, <laughs> later my husband, the dive instructor. And I did a few shallow solo dives and it wasn't a big deal. A lot of the people did it on the boats. Um, but at one particular time I went down alone, it was incredible visibility absolutely incredible for the poor nights. And I went down to around 40 metres, which is near the edge of recreational dive limits. And I remember hanging there in midwater and I just wanted to stay there. And I was most likely knocked, as they say, which is the euphoria of nitrogen narcosis. I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to stay down there. It wasn't so much that I wanted to die, but I didn't want my time underwater to end. And I just remember looking around and being so happy, just loving it (laughs) and just never, ever wanting it to end. But uh, I'm a responsible person and I was thinking about working and finishing my shift on the boat, whatever it was, and I'm responsible and I needed to go. And so I very carefully made my way back to the surface. But after that, I never dived alone again. Mindfulness and living in the moment. So mindfulness is awareness of the present moment rather than dwelling in memory or planning or worrying about the future. And scuba diving is great for mindfulness because you have to live in the moment. You have to focus on breathing in and out and looking at the world around you and also accepting your physical reality in that moment. You know, you feel the temperature of the water, you can sense your mental state, you can look at things. And yeah, I mean, you you really have to be mindful of that moment. Also, when you scuba dive for recreation, you usually have one tank of air. Some people do have uh, twin tanks and things, but usually one tank of air. So you have to monitor your air levels. And if you're nervous or worried, you breathe faster and you use up your air more quickly, which means you have uh, less time on your dive. So you can tell new divers usually because they suck their air super fast, (laughs) whereas more experienced divers can last a lot longer because they are I guess you don't have to be mindful of your breath. You just have to be more relaxed and you'll be breathing in a more relaxed manner. So, um, of course, you must never hold your breath. Super important. So you're always breathing in and out and the bubbles rise to the surface in this kind of meditation. Um, There are also moments of physical sensation that are hard to find anywhere else. So uh, flying off the edge of a drop off in great viz is like that. So you get your buoyancy right so you're weightless and fin off the edge of a coral reef over the deep blue. And to me, that is the closest we would get to flying. Um, I haven't been flying, (laughs) like as in, well, I've done parachute, um, parachutes, uh, jumps and stuff, but that was not nothing like this, which is, you know, totally relaxed, finning off the edge of the blue. And I've done that in Australia on the Barrier Reef, in Fiji, in Tonga, in the South Pacific, where the visibility goes down a long way. And the deep blue could be the sky and there's fish like birds beneath you and you just feel super relaxed and happy. So that would be uh, a moment of mindfulness of just relaxation and enjoying the moment. I also appreciate the feeling of insignificance. Again, this is memento mori, remember that we will die. So when I've been scuba diving, I've had these moments where I've looked at the fish and the world beneath the water and you realise that it doesn't matter whether you are there watching it. And this carries on regardless, whether you're dead, whether the world ends, uh, I mean, or whether the human world ends, uh, let's say that this life will continue without you. And some might find that morbid, but I love that perspective. It makes me happy to know that the world continues, even if I don't. So what's so interesting looking back now as a writer is how little I wrote of those moments. Most of this has been done. um, I mean, I have my travel journals and my dive logs, but these moments I've shared with you live far more strongly in my visual memory because, of course, you can't write when you're underwater. So and you can't usually take a picture. Certainly back when I did most of my scuba diving, um, the tech wasn't so good. Now there's better tech now, but inevitably underwater pictures never give you the scope of the experience and they never give you that visceral feeling of what it was like. So you have to capture those moments in your mind and here I am many years later sharing it with you. 
So after all that excitement and wonder and awe and loving it, why did I stop scuba diving? (laughs) So I did the bulk of my diving in Australia and New Zealand, where I lived from mid-2000 to 2011, when I moved back to the UK. Now, it's easier to scuba dive when you live near the ocean and only a few hours from some incredible dive sites. So if I was living in Auckland in New Zealand, um, only a couple of hours to go north to Tutukaka and the Poor Knights Islands, which are just fantastic. Fantastic. And I mean, in Australia, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of diving, possible diving. So I also, I guess, lifestyle wise, I married a scuba diving instructor in 2001. We divorced in 2004. So the years we had together had a lot of diving in them. He was also a boat skipper. So a lot of my diving was free or subsidised. So uh, we even had a diving business for a little while. So when we split up, I did carry on diving, but I also found new interests. Um, I met my my second husband, Jonathan, who's also a diver, but we prefer other things like walking and cycling and yoga and cultural adventures. Um, so re- realistically, you need to, you know, obviously some people every year book a couple of dive trips and do it that way. But, uh, you know, we we do other things. Now, you do need to dive regularly, I think, if you want to get the most out of scuba diving. It's a bit like driving. You lose confidence if you don't do it regularly. And a dive isn't always perfect. So you need multiple days and that can be pricey. It's not a cheap sport, especially if you buy all your own gear. And over time, without practice, I find the fear creeps back. You think about it too much. Your body confidence begins to drain away. (laughs) And like any physical skill, the more you do it, the more comfortable you become. So it all comes down to choice. And how do you choose to spend your time and money? In moving back to Europe, I chose culture museums and art galleries and architecture and theatre and other experiences over days out on the boat and scuba diving. Whereas New New Zealand is very much about outdoor living and that is where I did most of my diving. So will I scuba dive again? There is a question. I don't know. I really don't. I haven't scuba dived for a few years. The last dive I did was in New Zealand and I it was a terrible day, to be honest. And before that, we dived in Bali and that wasn't great either, to be honest. So I think when I you, you, that's what I mean about having to do it quite regularly in order to have and have multiple days. So you have different experiences. But the things I've told you about feel like a special part of my life that have passed. And that's OK, because there are phases to life. And change is the only constant. Now, I love to snorkel and I will possibly dive again in tropical waters where I don't have to wear such a thick wetsuit. Uh, But scuba diving gave me what I needed back then, a way to refocus on enjoying life, discover new things, make new friends and learn more about the underwater world and ultimately myself. So even if you don't want to scuba dive, you can still experience the wonder of travelling beneath the waves by visiting aquariums or watching shows like Blue Planet, which are just amazing. After all, travel is about wonder and discovery as well as experience. So those are some of my thoughts on uh, scuba diving. Uh, Just a couple of books, um, since this is books and travel. Um, A book I read recently, it's not so much about scuba, but about that. some of those feelings that I've talked about, which I think are the truth of scuba diving. It's called Deep Free Diving, Renegade Science and What the Ocean Tells Us About Ourselves by James Nestor. And uh, that is... Yeah, it's just an exploration of human potential, why we're drawn to the deep and also some fascinating um, stories about people who live much more in the ocean. Uh, Then just a couple of others, a neutral buoyancy. Adventures in a Liquid World by Tim Ecott, I or Eckott. I remember reading that a number of years ago, and it's kind of a history of undersea exploration and the emergence of dive culture, and really enjoyed that book. Uh, obviously, My Dark Queen, um, The Dark Queen, an underwater archaeology short story by me, J.F. Penn. Uh, a Sunken City, A Lost Goddess, One Last Dive to Risk It All. And uh, I narrated the audio book of that. So if you fancy listening, uh, I found a romance by Nora Roberts called The Reef, 
a marine archaeologist and a salvager join forces to search for a legendary treasure in this novel that takes readers to the depths of the Caribbean and the heights of passion and suspense. I love the fact that Nora Roberts has written a romance about scuba diving, so that's very cool. And of course, Clive Cussler's Dirk Pitt novels, which I think are partially responsible for my own need to scuba dive. Um, I think he does less now, but Dirk Pitt and his underwater agency, lots of scuba diving, bit James Bondy, uh, still fun read. So there are some of the books. Okay, well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's episode on scuba diving. You can always leave a comment on the show notes. Uh, If you go to booksandtravel.page forward slash listen, you'll find um, all the different um, episodes. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. Please do let me know if you have any thoughts or comments or questions about scuba diving or memories. Um, It's always wonderful to share or any book recommendations actually about, about scuba diving. So thanks for listening. Happy travels and I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.